psychology, became a licensed psychologist in, in um, Colorado and got became chief psychologist and executive director of a very large community mental health center that served the whole central and southern part of Colorado. And I thought I would be doing, it was a big job, 8,600 square mile catchment area, nine offices, very big multi-million dollar operation. And I thought I would do that for the rest of my life. I was very young and just you know, had a very big job, but I started to, uh, I, I became very close friends with a guy by the name of Dr. Joe Vigil, who was a track and field legend. He was an Olympic legend and in his ability to produce um, incredible track and field athletes, um, particularly distance runners. And he got me running and he got me excited about the application of psychology to human performance, which I've never thought about. He kept asking me, you know, Jim, as a psychologist, what, what can you tell me to help me get more out of my athletes? And I said, I looked at him like a deer in headlights. And I said, you know, I don't have a clue. I've spent all my life learning about how to help people who are struggling mentally to get a little healthier but I have no clue how to take normal, healthy people and make them extraordinary. And this was back in the 70s. And he said, well, Jim, you want to look into this. It's going to be a huge area. And you might be, you love to pioneer things. So that was really the first time I started to think about the value of sport in building strong human beings. And from that point on, it's been a center, fo a center focus of all my work how can we take the stresses of competition, of sport, which sport is actually a compressed version of life. And you can have more crazy wild experiences in one year in sport than you have in 40 years of life. But if you learn how to handle it in sport, when virtually very few people die from the mistakes you make, but as a surgeon or as someone who's uh, in a high performance venue and actually as a mother or father, sometimes mistakes because you didn't learn them earlier can be catastrophic. And so all of my passion has been for many years now, trying to leverage, to use sport to help people get, become extraordinary in their ability to manage stress, become good solid human beings and to build the muscles of character most importantly, moral and ethical character strengths. It's amazing that you touch upon that there because uh, one of the most famous football players and indeed coaches of all time, Johan Cruyff, mm. he so well eloquently put it, he called sport the university of life. And I think you yourself, Jim, you had a great way of depicting this in a presentation that you gave approximately seven to eight years ago, where it was the $50 million test <laughs> would, would you be so willing to engage with my audience now and describe and explain what that was? Well, I, I have many versions of that. What, which version did you hear? I've made a number of uh, of uh, kind of variations of that. Uh, which version did, did you did make sense to you? The one that most kind of touched upon me was where you presented two solutions for the $50 million. One was increasing the win ratio between from 50% up to 75%, or would you take the money and choose over the course of the season to raise valuable character traits amongst um, your players, such as integrity, trustworthiness, so on and so forth? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. I, I have, I've done so many different variations of that. I love teaching. I love being in front of people who are eager to learn and um, trying to help people understand, you know, I, I take people often to the end of their lives. I found that's the most powerful learning experience to ground people in what really matters. And so I asked them to, I, I you know, Stephen Covey, who was a, a very good friend, uh, particularly his son, Stephen M.R. Covey, um, he made a statement that I thought was very profound. He's made many, but he said, you know, start with the end in mind. So if you, if you know where you want to end up at the end of your life, 
And then you work backwards and you begin to recognize, well, what are the values that actually represent the most critical area of importance in your life? Um, and so I, I would take people, and I've done this literally with thousands of people. And at the Institute, we had nearly 400,000 people by the time um, uh, up to the current day, uh, I, we sold it to Johnson and Johnson, but it was a living laboratory. And I absolutely uh, love the opportunity. I love to collect data. I love to see what results are. But one of the most powerful uh, experiment, really exercise that I did was have people go and create, go to the end of their life and create what they wanted to have on their tombstone and to etch it out in stone. And they were allowed maybe six words or maybe two short sentences. Most of us are not granted the privilege of deciding what's going to be on our tombstone. Other people do that. And it's often just to make people feel good. It's not necessarily true. But you have the opportunity to carve what you believe are the are the representations of the most successful life you could have had. If this is the legacy you left behind, this is the ultimate, ultimate um, idea for you of a successful life. And I call that getting home, getting home. Home is, is simply ending up at the end of your life where you want to end up. And so, uh, people, you know, start working at that. And it's hard work. You have to really go through all the dimensions of your life. What do you really want to represent? Most importantly, while you were here, something that actually um, has no equal. This is the most important, you know, uh, thing you left behind in terms of your impact, the legacy that you had while you were here on planet Earth. So they work at that and work at that. And then when I have a large group together, I ask them to share publicly what they had on that tombstone, either a sentence or two or the six words. And the room is absolutely astonished because they realize that all the things that maybe had been getting most of their energy never showed up, never made the cut, literally the cut in stone how many world records they had. And I've worked with 17 number ones in the world, took them to number one. And none of that ended up on the tombstone. None of it. How, how much money they made, you know, what ended up was they wanted to be an extraordinary mother or father. They wanted to, they might put the words kindness, um, compassion, or um, loving. Caring, they ended up with words, and people were going, "Wait a minute! Did everybody copy from everyone else?" It was always their connection to other people, and these extrinsic achievements somehow got left off. Yet that's what was driving them for the entirety of their life, and they began to realize that if you want to have this, if you want to have an extraordinary, be an extraordinary mother or father, you know, just like you want to. You want to be a mass of billion dollars before you die. You have to really, really work like crazy to make that happen. So then we work backwards. If this is what you want to leave, how are you going to get it? These are earned. This is not normal. This is not something you just get because you want it. Every single day and the, and the enabling force is your energy. You have to invest energy just like you had to invest energy in carving that into that stone, you're gonna to have to every day invest energy in those things. You get back what you invest your energy in. And it, energy really um, creates life. It's taking life out of your body that you created and putting it into something or someone. And so you work backwards and then you keep track every day of the investments that you've made. And if you want to get home, you're going to have to work hard. The navigational system in your car doesn't work if you want to go home and you don't know where home is. But once you know the actual address 
not just the zip code or the city. What does it mean to be an extraordinary mother or father? What does it mean to have integrity in your life? What does it mean to be a person who represented kindness at the highest level or compassion or honesty, integrity, a great character and inspiration for others? What the heck does that mean? And so you have to really get granular and really understand that if I want that, I'm going to have to dig hard and work hard to make that happen. And I have to work at it every day. I have to be obsessed by making sure those are the things that I represent at the end of my life. And when people understand that, they understand what getting home is. Even if their home was not a great spot, all we're saying is getting home is ending up at the end of your life the way you, where you want to end up. And your, your, your life navigational system will not work if you don't have great clarity. If your energy is going to making more money or being world number one, and you don't pay attention to the things that matter most when you really think about it, you're not going to be fulfilled or satisfied. But you can have it all, maybe not maybe all, but you can have pretty much the trophies and the championships, but you better not lose sight of what I found to be the core of a person's life, and that is the most important purpose you were born with, and that will take you um, to the to the essence of what life is all about for you, and um, and that's what getting home is. So that was the most powerful exercise that I did. I have a number of variations that I worked with over so many years, 35 years. And um, it has changed people's lives, I will tell you. People have, have done that, and that I get feedback all the time, that that navigational system helped them to, to really chart a path that was not clear and they feel so much more aligned in their energy and in their life with what they most want out of life. And so for me, that was very exciting. I'm always looking for new ways to challenge the way people, we are just here. We don't know what the heck this is all about. We're trying to figure it out. And anything that can help us to get more clarity on what this world that we're in is all about. And now I'm trying to apply it to youth um, we have this, we had the Human Performance Institute. Now we have this Youth Performance Institute that we're trying to create this, all this understanding for young people. So I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunities I've had to be around amazing people. And uh, 